Exactly how bad was the Great Depression? Over four years, American incomes were cut by a quarter. Production fell by more than half. Stocks fell an astonishing 90% of their original price. And one out of every four workers was out of a job. But how did all of this happen? Imagine you're in the 1920s. To stimulate economic growth, the government more than doubles the money supply, artificially making loans easier to get. This causes a massive boom in unsustainable economic prosperity and stock market growth, creating the Roaring Twenties. The government then removes about a third of the money in the economy, reducing the availability of loans and lowering prices. This rollercoaster monetary policy, increasing interest rates, and lack of loans signal wise investors to get out of the market. The masses of people follow on Black Thursday, crashing the stock market. However, this type of crash isn't unusual. Past stock market crashes recovered quickly and without government intervention, like the Depression of 1920 to 1921. Stocks rise again and the economy could recover completely, but President Hoover passes the Smoot-Hawley Tariff, raising international trade barriers on imports to an all-time high, in an attempt to make people buy American to fix unemployment. In retaliation, foreigners raise their own trade barriers. This virtually closes our borders to international trade. American exporting industries are crushed. Agriculture collapses, ruining rural banks, and unemployment soars. As businesses close, the government deficit increases since no one can pay taxes. Instead of reducing government spending, Hoover doubles the income tax. President Roosevelt then wins the election, defeating Hoover, and promises to reverse Hoover's unpopular interventionist policies and reckless spending. However, Roosevelt does the opposite of what he vowed. He breaks the promise of the dollar by criminalizing ownership of gold and then devalues the dollar by almost half. He closes thousands of banks, destroying savings, creates social security, almost doubles the debt, enacts national minimum wage laws, throwing unskilled workers out of their jobs, and passes a series of economic programs called the New Deal, depressing the economy further. Incorrectly thinking that too much competition is a problem, Roosevelt enacts the National Industrial Recovery Act, which forces industries into government-run monopolies, and enacts hundreds of fascist-style regulatory codes, increasing the cost of doing business by an average of 40%. In fact, a man was put in jail for charging 35 cents instead of 40 cents to press a pair of pants. Trying to reduce the supply of goods and raise prices, Roosevelt creates the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which taxes productive farming, intentionally destroys viable livestock and crops, slaughters millions of piglets, burns fields, and pays farmers not to work. Economic stimulation, by destruction, not surprisingly, does not work. Roosevelt then raises taxes higher, takes the money and, through the Civil Work Administration and Works Projects Administration, starts paying unemployed workers to do silly things, such as study the history of the safety pin, catalog how to cook spinach, and chase tumbleweeds. With almost half the budget set aside for bureaucratic cost. These jobs destroy wealth, preventing money, capital, and labor from moving to productive sectors in effect paying people not to find jobs. If this stimulates the economy, then a thief who robs your house, steals your money, and spends it on coffee would be creating new wealth. With taxes and spending, wealth is diverted, not created. The Supreme Court eventually overturns Roosevelt's worst laws. The economy starts to recover naturally until it collapses again as a result of tax increases. Roosevelt then enacts an undistributed profits tax that makes business investment nearly impossible. The government tries to tax all incomes over 25,000 100%, fails, and then settles for higher taxes all around. Finally, Roosevelt enacts the Wagner Act, which means that labor disputes are no longer decided in the courts, but instead by an anti-business National Labor Relations Board, thereby removing equality under the law. All demands now made by labor unions must be met. Businesses are seized, unions go on strike, and violence spreads, all causing unemployment to skyrocket once more, creating a depression within a depression. As World War II rolls around and Roosevelt loses the election, international trade opens up, regulation decreases, and the Great Depression finally ends. Yet, it should linger in our minds today as one of the most tragic, 
failures of government policy in American history which might happen again. A great American myth is the claim that capitalism and the free market economy were responsible for the Great Depression, and that only government intervention brought about America's economic recovery. However, the truth is far from that. The free market economy would have corrected our flawed monetary policy as it always did before, but government intervention dragged the depression on for 12 long years, scarring America forever. Text based on the essay, Great Myths of the Great Depression, written by Lawrence W. Reed and published by Fee, the Foundation for Economic Education. The video was written, illustrated, produced, and read by Professor Chesterton.